Amen. Do you have another hallelujah in you? Hallelujah. That was really good. Kevin May prayed up the praise team pretty hard today, and it seemed like it worked. Good morning, church. I would like to take a minute to welcome you to the worship service, but I don't have time. No welcome today. We got so much to, to do today, we, we, we don't have a minute to spare, so we're going to go right to it. We are, have a real treat today. If you didn't notice in the bulletin, uh, Gretchen Tinsley is going to speak to us today. She has a testimony to give. If you don't know Gretchen, you're in for a real treat this morning. So we want to make sure that Gretchen has all the time she needs. We'll celebrate communion today. And Pastor Tim's going to bring what I think is going to be a really cool message. Usually when you read the Thursday Blast, you have a pretty good idea where he's going. And I read that three times this week and I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. But if you look at the scripture references buried right in the middle in 1 Peter 2, 8, there's a verse that I never really even saw before, and it says, a stone that makes them stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And he's going to wrap his message around that today, and I think we're going to go to, uh, to, to a new place, a deeper place. We're going to have some spiritual meat today. <laughs> Pastor, he, he hates it when I build his message up. Only announcement I have is uh, the ladies' event yesterday was a huge success. The place was packed. They ate and drank so much tea, they didn't have the energy to take the tables down. So they're asking, if you can, after the service, right out to Narthex, right into the uh, fellowship hall and help take the tables down. Hey, good morning. Well, this time I am looking for workers. We have a major, major mold problem. It's just sinking our ground down in. It makes it really hard to mow, um, really rough. So I had an exterminator come. Hopefully, hopefully that's going to work. But what I need to do Saturday at 9 o'clock, rain or shine, bring a shovel, and we need to fill those holes with dirt. So I have four wheelers. I could use some more with some wagons. Um, we can shovel the dirt to it because it's all the way from the front of the church all the way to Davison Road. It's massive destruction. The directory. Um, the next two weeks, Colleen will be here to take your pictures. Now, for all of you that are taking your pictures on the phone or working on it, uh, step two will be coming how we're going to get those pictures. This is a whole big tech thing, and I um, have low no. So I'm <laughs> counting on my tech person to get me through this. Um, Pastor really wants to see all our faces in this directory, but if you're camera shy and you don't want to, um, we're just going to have the names in the back like we did at the last one. Okay, thank you, and I'll see everybody Saturday the 13th at 9. Woohoo! <laughs> how this church would get along without Kim Peters. Man, is she busy. She is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Yes. I don't have any details. Oh, we're going to play a video. Can we have a, a retreat video, please?
So hey, girl, hey. Um, we have sign-up sheets in the narthex with uh, information on what you need to know, but we would love to have everybody um, who can and would love to um, come. We do have beds for 25 to spend the night, um, but there's also floor space for um, air mattresses if we get more than 25. So um, Diane will be out in the narthex right after service if you have any questions. We also have contact information and interest lists for um, South Harbor Creek WOW, Women of Worship. So if you'd like to collect that and uh, get together with some of the ladies, feel free to do that. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Welcome to the worship service at South Harbor Creek Church. Let's have the opening prayer. Father God, we are on a schedule today. We are busy, busy. And yet we turn this time to you and Holy Spirit, if you would come and take this service where we can't even see where it's going. We set all this time aside for you. May each of the th sections of the service today bring glory to you. Holy Spirit, direct each of the words, each of the songs that would help us to turn towards Jesus with every thought and every prayer that we have today. May all the glory go to the Father this morning. We look forward to what you have for us today. We ask your anointing on the pastor as he comes. We ask your anointing and your blessing on Gretchen as she comes to share. And we are open to what you have for us this morning, Father God. Holy Spirit, would you come? Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Today's reading is from Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5, and verses 15 through 16. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. This is the word of God for the people of God.
changed up the bulletin with Jim. That's one of the benefits of sitting next to him up there. Um, we have Sunday school right after the kids talk, so I need to scoot out. So that's why we're switching things up a little bit. Um, before we go to prayer today, I want to mention um, we got to see Elna yesterday. She came for a little bit, still not feeling 100%. So let's continue to be praying for Elna that she continues to heal and feel better. Um, we need to be praying for Fran. She's going to be having heart valve replacement but she has a lot of tests that she needs to get through before she um, is able to be approved for that. So let's be praying for Fran as she goes. Anybody who's had medical stuff and has to go through all the red tape and all that stuff. So let's be praying for Fran. We need to continue to pray for Mike Neenan. Um, he was in the hospital again for a couple days this week. Let's just continue to pray for him. Again, you know, sometimes after these surgeries, it takes a while for us to feel back to normal. And some of us are stubborn and don't like to, to wait. So there's Dorothy, she's nodding her head. <laughs> So let's be praying for, for Mike with that. We want to be praying for Bill McQuiston, who's Brenda's um, brother-in-law. I heard her giving someone an update today, but just be praying for him. He was in the hospital with some congestive heart, lung stuff. So let's be praying for him. And right before we go to, oh, one more. Daryl Thompson, I got a message from Vicki yesterday, a cousin of Elmer's. And then I talked with Robin this morning, and Robin is a real good friend of him, and he went to school with me, so I've known him since elementary school. And um, he's in the hospital in intensive care, really not doing well. So let's be praying for Daryl, for his family, just that God would sustain him and be close to him. One of the things I remember about Daryl is when we were in elementary school, we had like a Christian club at school, and he was a part of that. So I know Daryl knows Jesus. And so we just need to be praying that he's close to him right now. One more thing, Maddie this week, our Maddie who's in our youth group, there was a talent show at um, Erie High. And our Maddie, who sings with the youth praise team, sang Reckless Love to her class. So I posted it on, um, on the Shumi page, but you need to check it out. But there's just a whole lot of great things about that. The fact that she did a beautiful job. But also, what a testament of her faith. She could pick any song to sing. And she sang about a song that has touched her and meant a lot to her. So shout out to Maddie. We're really proud of her and, and thank God for what he's doing in her life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with a lot on our hearts. With a lot of, first of all, gratitude for all of the good things that are going on in our lives. You know, sometimes we get so weighed down with the things that are, that are our struggles, that are our distractions, that, um, that are those things that people we love when they're hurting. So many things weigh us down. But Father, this morning we come to you with gratitude. We come to, gr to you with gratitude that we woke up this morning and we were able to come to this place and fellowship with one another and fellowship with you. Lord, we thank you for our families. We thank you for our children. We thank you for so many good things that you have brought into our lives and allow us to experience and be a part of with your creation, with, um, with just delighting and being with one another, with encouraging one another through your word. Lord, we just are so grateful and thank you for that. Lord, for the things that are heavy on our hearts, you tell us that you want us to come to you with them that there's nothing that we're going through, no struggle, no um, illness, that you are not right beside us. But Father, we need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge that you are right there with us and that you want to give us your strength, your peace, your hope in any situation. So Father, those that are, are struggling with peace right now and that patience in waiting for healing, we ask that you would give them your supernatural peace and patience. For those, Lord, that are struggling with major illnesses and not sure what tomorrow holds, Lord, we pray that you'd be especially close, that you would be closer than they've ever felt you in, your, in their whole life, that they would know you, Lord, that they would know that you are a good father who loves them and cares for them and never, ever will leave them. 
Father, we want to pray for the families of our church, for our kids that um, that have so many things on their plates and so many struggles that they go through that they don't even tell us about. Lord, we want to lift up our kids to you. Father, we want to lift up the marriages in this church to you. Father, we pray for your strength. We pray for, for families that are led by marriages that that are focused on you, that are not perfect, that are struggling, but Lord, in their struggle, they know that you are the source of their strength. So Lord, we pray this morning for every marriage in this church, for those that are struggling, for those that are experiencing a good season right now, we lift them up to you and help us, Lord, to encourage one another um, for your health and your peace and your love in those relationships. Father, we just come to you with so much on our hearts today, but again, we end this with, with gratitude and love for all that you've already done in our lives. Be with us now, Father, as we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Patty and Carrie here. We're missing all those kids from Arizona already. That was awesome. That was a great family. How you guys doing? Yeah. I'm going to tell you a story today. Do you like stories? Everybody likes stories, right? People like to hear stories. Some people like to tell stories. You know who like to tell stories? Come on, we're in church. Take a guess. What's that? Jesus. Very good. Jesus. Jesus loved to tell stories, and Jesus told stories because he liked to tell stories, but he all, it was important because a lot of the people in Jesus' time didn't know how to read and write. So when Jesus was teaching people, it was easier for him to tell a story and kind of paint a picture in their brain because they could remember what he was teaching better, and then when they went home, they could tell the story, and the people and their friends and family, they could learn what Jesus was teaching. So Jesus told a lot of stories. Jesus taught a lot of things. He only had three years and most of the time when he was teaching, he was only teaching to a very small group of his friends and family. And he had a lot to get out of his heart and a lot to get out of his mind. So he taught a lot. So when you're reading along, if you read the Gospel of Matthew and it, you get into like chapter 6 and 7, there's just a lot. He's just on and on and on the teaching. And he teaches them about storing their treasures in heaven. He teaches them about a narrow gate and a broad road that some people choose. He teaches them about good trees and bad trees. He teaches them, don't judge people. Don't. He's teaching, teaching, teaching. And I think at one point Jesus said, you know, I'm talking to these guys so much, I got to stop here and, and tell them a little story and help them remember. So, so Jesus said, all these things I'm teaching you, all these words I'm giving you, he said, he says, if you hear my words and do what they say, then you're like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And when the wind blows and the rain comes, and the Bible says when the streams rise, the house stands firm because he built it on a strong foundation. But then he said, if you hear all these things I'm teaching and you don't do what I'm t teaching you, then you're like a foolish man. And the foolish man built his house on sand. Right? You guys ever build a sand castle at the beach? Uh-huh. You ever build it too close to the water? What happens? Destroyed. The Bible says when the wind comes and the rain comes and the streams rise, the house comes crashing down. Okay? So what Jesus was saying, don't just hear what I'm telling you. You got to put this stuff, you got to take it into your heart and do it. So when Jesus was telling the story about the house, build your house, 
What he was really talking about was their lives, the things that they did, right? He wasn't talking about a house. He was using that for an example. But he wanted them to build their house on a strong foundation, right? And he was talking about the wind and the rain and the streams. He wasn't talking about real wind and rain beating up against house. He was saying, in life, sometimes things happen, right? Not always good things happen, right? You guys are kind of little, so hopefully only little thing, things are happening. But when you get bigger, the wind and the rain, it's real. So, right, you got to build your house, build your life on that, okay? So, so stick with me. We're almost there. You guys come to Sunday school, you come to church, you guys have learned that Jesus has lots of names, right? Not just Jesus. What, anybody know another name for Jesus? Go ahead. God is very good. Go ahead. Christ is very good. Anybody else? He's called Savior. He's called Lord. He's called King of Kings. He's called Bright Morning Star. Jesus has so many names, right? But one special name that Jesus has is the Rock. That's another name for Jesus. You can call Jesus the rock. So when Jesus was saying, build your life upon the rock, upon the firm foundation, what he was saying was him, the things he teaches, and, and on Jesus himself. So we build our lives on a firm foundation, which is Jesus. And that way, when the things of life come, right, our house doesn't come crashing down. We stand firm, right? Good job. Let's say a quick prayer. You guys go to Sunday school. such a blessing that you send children to us, Lord, and we give you thanks for each and every one of them. May your word be planted in their heart, and may we watch over the years as you water and grow that word. We give you thanks. We pay a blessing on our Sunday school teachers as they come. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Several months ago, <clears throat> excuse me, I had, to, I had the privilege and the opportunity to sit down with Gretchen, and she started to tell me her story, and it's a pretty amazing story. And I said to her, I said, Gretchen, I says, I need you to tell your story in the church. She goes, okay. That shocked me right there. Because usually they say, oh, I don't know, Pastor, I don't know if I can do that. But Gretchen has been really gracious. And as you know, Gretchen is going to be leaving us here very soon. And it's going to be a sad time for this congregation. But while she's still here, I've asked her to come and to tell. She actually has a couple stories. I've asked her to tell one of them. So Gretchen, if you would mind coming up. That good? That's it, that's it. Okay. I just want to share with you some of the experiences that I have shared with God and other people, particularly the people of Romania. Um, we originally went in 1992, right after the revolution, uh, not knowing what we would find and my husband didn't want me to go because it was too dangerous. And I said, I kept praying about it and praying about it. And I finally said to him, I need to go. Because I could see that most of the people that were going were men. And they were relating to the men. But there are many children and many women. And so I thought, I need to go and work with them. And so that they had, you know, a, a contact. Um, our, ho my, our first host was a Pentecostal pastor and his wife. And they continued to be our friends. And they continued to be our hosts every time we would go back to Romania. And uh, they had nine children. Uh, we became very close, the wife and I. And, well, the whole family. But anyways, um, 
Their names were Philemon and Bujorica. And they had a, nine children, but they had one son that was special. His name was George. And George had a severe cleft palate. And he had had numerous surgeries in Romania done by different groups that came in from out of the country, but they really had not been able to correct the problem. Uh, he had difficulty speaking, he had difficulty breathing, and John and I were there on one of our follow-up trips, and we were staying with his family, and they invited us to stay for dinner. They said they had a guest from the United States. And so at that time, I met this guest from the United States who was a Pentecostal pastor from Duluth. And he had made the arrangements in Duluth for this child to come to the United States to have a series of operations to correct his cleft palate and the numerous problems that he had with his mouth. And the mother was very reluctant. She didn't know any English. And the son didn't either. And they were really frightened to come to the United States where they couldn't communicate with the people. And I offered to act as a translator. Now, I knew some Romanian. I wasn't sure how much I knew, but this woman and I were very good friends and had tremendous trust in each other. And so it was arranged that they would come over and I told them, I will meet you at the airplane when you get off in the United States. And I will stay with you as long as you are in the United States to act as a translator. And it was, it was very interesting. We stayed in the same house. A woman that lived next door, the pastor, had extra bedrooms, and I had one, and they shared one. And um, Romanians have a lot of beliefs, and I guess you could say customs that go back a long time that are unusual to us. And sometimes they have difficult, difficulty understanding ours. Well, George and Bujerica arrived in Duluth, and the day after they got there, they had four doctor's appointments because he was scheduled for four different surgeries on the same day. And the mother, of course, like I said, didn't understand any English. And he didn't either. But I was so thankful because they both trusted me. They, we had been friends for years and we had been through a lot in Romania. So anyways, when they arrived, uh, I went the first day with them to meet all the doctors and help as much with the understanding as I could as the doctors are explaining things to them. And then uh, the day of surgery, we went to the hospital in Duluth where all the surgeries had been arranged to be done with no cost to the Romanians. The Pentecostal church and the doctors, a lot of the doctors were donating their treatments. Um, the day before we went was a Sunday, and <laughs> I didn't expect that. But anyways, uh, the first thing I had to do was introduce myself to their congregation and then translate for them to the Americans of the church that were sponsoring them. Everything just fell into place, and I, I was amazed by how easy it was. Now, I knew some Romanian, 
but I didn't know a lot. But of course, the mother knew how much I knew. And I took my Romanian dictionary, my English dictionary with me to Duluth. And we, they, the day he went for surgery, they explain, explained to us that it's going to be a four hour surgery. And so the mother and the pastor and I were sitting in the waiting room. And they would come down every now and then and let us know how the surgery was going. Well, that meant that I had to translate for the Romanians what the doctors were saying. And uh, she just, she was just so, so trusting. And uh, I had prayed that God would help me, help me with the language, help me, I know a lot of words, but help me to recall the words I needed. And one of the things was, uh, after he had surgery, they took him back to his room, and of course, after surgery, you always want a, a drink of water. Well, of course, they wouldn't give him any water. They told him they could have ice chips, and that was it. And I thought, oh, no. Because in Romania, they believe that ice causes sore throats. So how was I going to convey to them that what the doctors were doing for them was what was right, they would not hurt him in any way, and I was so thankful because when I explained things to the mother, she accepted it. And as a matter of fact, she got to the point that she would, when he needed ice, she would even go out to the nurse's station and get ice to bring in. So she understood what we needed to do. The three of us spent a room in the hospital, in Duluth Hospital. Um, there were two beds. He had one, and the mother and I took turns napping on the other one. Uh, I was, we were all at the hospital for a month. And it was such a joyous time for me to be able to be with these close friends of mine that I had known since 1992, and this was in the year uh, 2001. But anyways, the surgery was successful, and I'll never forget his last appointment. We were in the doctor's office, and the doctor came up to him with this big pair of tweezers, and he had, I didn't, I didn't realize what he had, but they went ahead and he removed these plastic that was about this big around that had been rolled to keep the nasal passage open. But I said to George, I said, don't worry, he will not hurt you. He's only here to help you. And so, but his eyes, when that came out of his nose, <laughs> was quite surprising. And he had them in both sides of his nose. And then, um, the next thing that I remember is, you know, he, of course, he was very thankful to all the doctors who had donated their care, and they all, you know, had worked with him and so forth. And I'll never forget, as we went to the elevator after he'd seen the doctor for the last time, we're standing at the elevator, and he said something to his mother. And I said, what did he say? And she said, he said he can breathe for the first time. He was 11 years old. And like I said, that was in 2001. He is getting married the end of June. I'd been invited to the wedding, but I'm not going to Romania. Uh, but he and I have been in touch all along. He sends me Facebook pictures and things, and he said after the wedding, they will send me lots of pictures of the wedding, and that way I get to see the whole family too. But 
I just, it, it was like, it was an answer to what I felt when I first was going to go. And that was that God had a purpose for me to go. And I f felt that I needed to go to be available to work with the women and the children to develop their trust and work with them in different ways. And I'm happy to say that George, that's his name, is doing very well. And I will never forget the first time I saw him in Romania, which was about mm, six months after he'd had the surgery. I was walking down the street and I saw him come out of a little shop. Well, in Romania, you don't call out on the street. You just, you know, sort of keep to yourselves. But I thought, I've got to catch him. So, so I yelled, George. And I got his attention, and he came over. And that was the first that I got to see him after the surgery, and he had returned to his country. And it was just so exciting, and I was so happy that God was able to use me to help him and his family. And when he had the surgery, they asked him, well, are you concerned about looks or speaking. He said, I want to be able to speak so that I can read the Bible to other people, share with other people, and they can understand me. So that's a story of George and my time in Romania. Gretchen didn't say, and I hope maybe you heard it, was that the Holy Spirit gave her the ability to speak in tongues. To be able to speak to a foreign person in a language that they would understand and share the gospel with them. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of God. And we need to celebrate that today. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we are grateful. We're grateful for those times when you send your Holy Spirit upon us and give us the ability to overcome obstacles, overcome difficulties, overcome barriers to reach out and share your love, your mercy, and Jesus Christ with those around us. Lord, as we give back to you, give as we give out of love and out of thankfulness, we ask you to receive our gifts and bless them, multiply them, use them for your will to further your kingdom. 
we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from the first epistle of Peter, the second chapter, verses 2 through 10. Peter writes these words. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of God for the people of God. How many of you have had the joy and the pleasure of rising up out of your bed in the middle of the night to use the restroom, use the bathroom, and you step on a Lego. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And the reason that I use Legos is because it works so well in this message. Because that is a pain that you will not forget. That is a pain that the moment I said it, you all went like this. Because you know what it feels like. But to a little kid, that's a building block. Even to you adults, trust me, I know you play with them too. You build things, right? Maybe you build a little house. You build a little wall. Uh, my son, I don't know quite where he got his ambition, but he builds ships and tanks out of Legos. And they're pretty neat looking. I've seen a few of them. So the very same thing that causes you pain and misery is also the thing that you can use to build things. Isn't that true with just about everything that we have? You can take any tool. I don't care what tool it is. You can take a butter knife. You can use it for good or you can use it for bad, can't you? Am I right? Think of any tool that we have created as human beings that has been used for good and for bad. 
The man who invented dynamite, re, re, you know, he, 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 re, he, he hated the thought of it. He made it for good, but it has been used way too often for bad purposes. Well, you know what? Jesus is our Lego this morning. Jesus, if we follow Jesus, if we believe in Jesus as we sang earlier, we believe in Jesus Christ. If we believe he is our foundation, he is our cornerstone, he is our building block, the strong foundation that we build upon to remain steady even in the storms of life. And we all face plenty of storms. But to those who don't believe, to those who choose to ignore Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who choose to, to just flat out deny the existence of God and the Holy Spirit, Jesus becomes that Lego in the middle of the night. Think about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In Luke 20, Jesus is teaching in the temple, and the chief priests are trying to challenge him. You know, now these are very learned individuals. They, they know the scriptures. In fact, they probably invented a few scriptures of their own that weren't actually written. And Jesus is healing people, and then the Pharisees say to him, by what authority, Luke 20, verse 2, what authority do you have that you do these things? Jesus, he knew what they were trying to do, and, and he replies in verse 3, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? And you know that story, you know they can't answer that question because no matter how they answer that question, it makes them look bad. Because if it's human origin, then, then the people who, who followed John, who, who took part in that baptism, will revolt and create all kinds of chaos. But if they say it's, a hu if it's from heaven, then Jesus is going to say, well, why don't you believe? So they know they can't answer the question, and they choose not to, and Jesus doesn't answer their question either. And a second time, <clears throat> Jesus is being questioned why he heals on the Sabbath. Now, you know the Sabbath is, is a holy day. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Now, we here in America simply have destroyed that idea altogether. But I don't know if you watched the coronation yesterday or not. But the rabbi that was there, he couldn't drive. It's the Sabbath. So the king actually put him up in a house near the coronation site so that he could be there, so he could walk over there and offer a Jewish blessing upon the king. So the Sabbath is a big deal, and, and Jesus is being questioned in Luke 14, 5. It says, you know, why are you doing this? And Jesus responds, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And the answer is yes, they would, which means they work on the Sabbath, which means they're healing on the Sabbath, even though that's not what they called it. Now, the, the lesson today is not about working on the Sabbath. It's about believing. And we're going to see a lot of people in our lives, and, and I know you have seen a lot of people in your lives, that they either don't believe or their faith is so limited, you know, they probably haven't darkened a church since maybe they were four or five years old. 
and yet somehow they seem to succeed in life, right? Somehow it seems like they, they manage to get lots of money or, or they just seem to be successful in the things that they do. And so we might ask ourselves, you know, we might question this particular scripture here. Well, if these people are succeeding and they don't believe, do I really need Jesus? Well, I want you to look at those successful people. Actually look deep into their lives. Most of them live very lonely existence. Think about people like Bernie Madoff. That's a great name for him, Madoff. It's like he made off with everybody's money. (laughs) But look, you know, there he was. He had everything. He had everything. I mean, he could not want for anything, yet he continued to deceive the people. And his world came crashing down on him. How many times have we seen athletes who seem to, you know, they get these amazing contracts and you're like, good grief, where is all this money coming from? And then in a blink of an eye, they destroy themselves, maybe not physically, but emotionally and mentally, they destroy themselves. And they're lost and gone. Or, as the NFL, NHL, NBA, and and Major League Baseball have all figured out, these young kids coming out of college or out of high school, whatever it is, they don't know how to handle money. Heck, most of us in this room don't know how to handle money. And they're suddenly given this big contract, and they just go out and start spending everything. And even though they're making millions and millions and millions, they end up bankrupt. They don't have Jesus. They're not following Jesus. They're not living out the life that Christ has called for them. So once again, We are asked, do we believe? Do we believe? Because if you believe, if you believe, you will be like the builder that builds his house upon the rock. The storms will come, the winds will blow, the hail will fall, the snow will pile up. Okay, that was a little dark there. <laughs> we didn't have snow this year. I don't know. But those things are going to happen, right? But if we build our house on that firm foundation, we will be able to weather those storms. If we build our house on the sand, our spiritual life will not be able to withstand that. And our lives, will follow suit. So believe. Believe in God the Father. Believe in Jesus Christ the Son. Believe in the Holy Spirit and live. Let us pray. Almighty God, You have, <clears throat> excuse me, you have provided the cornerstone, you have provided the foundation. And you simply ask us to rest upon it, to build upon it. Guide each and every one of us here, young, old, and everything in between, to follow your way, to believe completely with our hearts and souls and minds. So on that day of reckoning, you will welcome us in and say, well done, good and faithful servant. We pray in Jesus' name.
I kind of got into watching the coronation yesterday. I, did, I hadn't planned on it. But the alarm went off at about 4.30 in the morning. And my wife got up, and that's highly unusual. And I'm thinking, why is she getting up? Why is that alarm going? This is Saturday. We don't set the alarm on Saturday. And it's like, oh, that's right. She wanted to watch Coronation. So I stayed in bed another hour, which was fine by me. And I got up and then watched it with her. But what I found amazing was the worship that took place there. And I really appreciated the archbishop's message about being a servant. Every one of us, not just the king, but every one of us is called into servanthood to be there for others. And then when they were about to do communion, I was, I was thrilled when he said, this is commanded by God to do. To do it as often as you eat and drink this cup and this bread in remembrance of what Christ has done for us. That victory over sin and death, the reason that we celebrate this amazing Easter season cross is empty. Death has been beaten. So let us prepare our hearts and minds this morning as we this morning remember what Christ has done for us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead and to the, to the inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ who called us out of the darkness to his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he, he promised that he would be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, 
This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it to his disciples and said to them, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make, for, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. We do have some visitors with us today, and so for your sake, what we do is we just come out aisle by aisle, come down, and you'll be served here in the front, both the bread and the cup, and then there are receptacles at the end of the altar to place your cups. God has called us to this moment to remember and, and in a lot of ways rejoice. Rejoice that the cross is empty, the tomb is empty, and you and I have new life because of it. That should cause us great rejoicing. Would you please, please come forward? table is set. Come and remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
One who was unable to come forward, we will be happy to come to you. Let us pray. To you, Almighty Father, we give complete thanks and praise. We pray that our worship here today has been, been joyous to you. We pray that the music has lifted up not just your soul, but all the souls here this morning and those who watch with us online. We thank you for this meal, this bread and this cup, that it reminds us of a feast that awaits us when we get home. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name.
case you haven't noticed, spring has sprung. I know many of you with allergies are singing a whole different tune, <laughs> but we need to be thankful. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord send his Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us here today so that we won't stumble over the rock of Jesus Christ, but we will build upon him and live in glory. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see an empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, that will be long to you. Bethany, there is Bethany. Can you um, leave the sound on, but mute all the microphones except for the 